Hi, this is Pat Love with Pat's Two Cents. We're going to read from 1 Peter chapter 3. Okay, I got to read from the beginning. I'm sorry. Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Now, the conversation does not mean blah, 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 blah. The conversation, your whole demeanor, your attitude, the way you carry out, the way you carry yourself, your total carriage, everything about you, your character, all of that involved. All right. Now, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, who's adorning, listen to this, let it not be with the outward adorning of plaiting the hair and a wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel. Now see, this is the part they missed. <coughs> this is a quick aside before I get to the main portion of the meal. This, the, in the church I used to go to, they used to have all this legalism. No makeup, no jewelry, no plaiting, no, I mean, all kind of stuff. No, 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 no. Now, and if this were literally taken, you would not plait your hair. You would not wear gold or jewelry. But on the other hand, you also would not wear clothes. Think about it. It says, who's adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel. That's putting on clothes. But let it be the hidden man. What God is saying is don't concentrate on the outside, on the package. Concentrate on the contents. The content of our character. But let it be the hidden man of the heart. In that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Mm. For after this manner in the old time, holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being in subjection unto their own husband. Now let's move on down to the crux of the matter. This is the meat of the message. I just had to share that because a lot of times we as wives get a little happy with our mouth. We tell a man to F off and drop dead and go to hell and all that. And we think we have a right to do that. Neither does a man have a right to put his hand on a woman. Man doesn't have a right to, to, to disrespect his wife in public. Never. That is not love. I had to throw that in. That's, that's for free. All right. So now we're going to get to the message. <clears throat> this is God dealing with the body of Christ. Verse 8 through verse 15. And that says, finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise, blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. What are y'all saying to each other? Verse 11, let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Hmm. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? But, and if ye suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Now, 
I got to read verse 16. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you, as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Whoa, how you carrying yourself? What's flying out of your mouth under pressure? Hmm. Yeah, that's something to think about. But the way we ought to deal with each other is through humility and love, compassion, courteousness. So if a person in your church land blast you and you're on the rag or you had a bad day with your wife that day, what are you going to do? Blast them back? Huh? What does the Bible say? Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrary wise blessing. I remember a woman told me one time it was so comical. Because the Lord had me that day. That was one of my good days. <laughs> yeah, I had some bad ones too, but we won't talk about that right now. Um, this is one of my good days. Uh, uh, she was saying, you just get on my last nerve. I hate that, I hate that, and I hate this, and I hate that. And I said, well, I love you, and I'm sorry. And I left it at that. Now, she couldn't argue with that. She just walked away. She couldn't say anything against it. What comes out of your mouth when someone else is blasting you, giving you the 411, uh, raking you up and down in the cold? I mean, I mean, what are you doing? What are you saying? What are you feeling? Are you feeling hatred? Are you feeling like, I'll knock you on your fanny. I'll slap the taste out of your mouth. What are you, what's going on in you? Hmm, right. Sometimes we have, too much lit because we have not learned to maintain that attitude. We have not learned to maintain our cool. And when it comes to the body of Christ, when it comes to relational issues and interaction with one another, it has to be in love. If it's not in love, it's poisoned by religion. The, the worst spirit in the church is a religious spirit. That's the worst to deal with because they'll put on the facade of being holy and, and sanctimonious and, and full of service and good deeds and good alms giving and, and, and they give this and they give that and they're the biggest givers and the biggest that and the biggest, but boy, I'm telling you, they'll give you pure D hell if you cross them. Oh, you better stay out of their way. See, <clears throat> many of us think we do really well. And I'm talking to you on YouTube. I'm more talking to you than I am to our group. Because our group, we got some jewels in our group. And they're not perfect. And they say it in a New York minute. But they're putting forth their effort. Are you putting forth an effort? Are you trying? Or are you quick to cuss somebody out just because you can? And God's merciful. And oh, well, you'll get over it. What, how do you treat your brothers and sisters in Christ, your husbands, your wives, your children? How do you treat each other? How do you interact? Now, Marlene talked about how the church is to deal with its people, with its poor, with its widows. What God is also dealing with in the scripture he gave me, how are we to treat each other on a one-on-one -on -one basis as we interact, as we serve together, as we pray together, as we share, as we counsel one another? How are we to react? You get up on the wrong side of the bed and you want everybody else to suffer for it. They didn't get you up on the wrong side of the bed, but you're making them pay for it because your attitude is funkadelic. Your attitude is foul. Your tongue is sharper than a two-edged sword. You slice people up like they're a, like a bologna slicing machine. You can give a person a compliment and then slash them across their face with an insult combined with it. It's, it doesn't make sense. 
It doesn't make sense why some of us get such pleasure at tearing each other down. Some of you on YouTube, you just tear each other down and you enjoy it. See, that's the sad part. That's when you know you're not operating out of the Holy Spirit. You're giving place to the devil. How are you treating one another? How are you talking to one another? If you have a word of correction, you blast it in front of everybody and embarrass them so that you so they'll never forget that you had something to tell them. You may be right in what you're saying, but you may be dead wrong in how you're delivering the message. You can tell somebody in public, don't you have more manners than that? What the heck is wrong with you? There's, there's a whole lot of people around here. You're not the only one eating. Why don't you wait till everybody else gets theirs? And blah, 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 blah. I've seen people do it so many times in public. And the person is like, oh, they weren't thinking. Maybe they were extra hungry that day, whatever. But now they are withered inside and they're trying to grin and bear it for the rest of the day. But you feel victorious because you put them in their place. Hello. Yes, you brought a word of correction. So how you like me now? Well, you ought to ask God, how do you like me, Lord? Because God is probably doing what it is in others. Can't handle that. Listen, why didn't you pull? This is what love does. The Bible says love covers a multitude of sin. So if you're operating out of love, agape love, as God's love, unconditional, then you take a person, you say, come here, babe, let me talk to you privately. You pull them aside. You say, now look, <clears throat> I know you're probably hungry as can be. I got you. I'm hungry too. But this is what we have to do. Now, next time, wait until everybody else gets there. Okay? No problem. Just wait till everybody else gets theirs. Because we want to make sure that everybody, we don't want to run out. <laughs> you know, we'll pray for the multi, you know, for the multiplication of this food, but we have to partake in that faith you know, by not eat, taking too much at first. So let's just try to portion our, our, you know, portion our plates for now. And then when everybody's gotten there, go on up and get seconds, girl, help yourself. Or go on up and get seconds, young man, help yourself. That's fine. But do it privately. You have protected and covered their dignity. Nobody in the room knows that you gave a word of correction. Nobody knows. Now, here's another one I want to talk about. <laughs> Compassion. You know, I fell short of that years ago. So I'm going to talk about me. So you won't think I'm just beating up on you. Because I fall short too, just like everybody else. Now, anybody says they don't fall short, they're lying straight from the pit. I, was, I had a customer and I did one good thing for her for about two years, and that was nice. But the thing that never occurred to me, and I asked the Lord, the woman was dead and gone with him. I led her to the Lord. But the one thing never occurred to me was to take her to the store or go shopping and get a, a grocery list, go shopping and take it to her house. Never occurred to me. She was a widow, she was an older woman, she was losing so much weight, it was getting scary. And she told me when I asked her, I saw her in the grocery store. That was my opportunity. Boy, did I miss it. I missed it. Didn't even occur to me. And after, years after she passed away, the Lord brought that memory to me. And I asked God to forgive me because it just never occurred to me. How many of you, it never occurs to you? to do things you ought to do. I'm in the grocery store with her. She's grocery shopping in a very narrow budget, very limited budget. And she's looking as skinny as a rail. She's not looking good at all. It's obvious she's not doing well. And I'm, we're hugging, how you doing, da da da. How come you haven't come to get your hair done? Well, I don't have the money. I, no, that's not the problem. You come get your hair done. So I was doing one thing that was nice because she didn't have to pay me. I knew what a hardship she was in. But here's the other side of that coin. 
It never occurred to me to say, come on, girl, let's go up to the thing. You get what you want and I'll pay for it. Why did that not occur to me? Hmm. Sometimes we get so caught up in me, myself, and I, or me and my four and no more, that we don't have time for other people's needs. I hate myself for not thinking of that because that woman was faithful. She was, oh, I want him to get into that. I refuse to get emotional right now. But that was a senior citizen who was really low on her luck right then. She was doing poorly because she had come to the rescue of a family member who left her holding the bag and she lost her house. She lost her car. She lost everything. And she was so poor it was pitiful as a result. And here I am standing right there talking to her and she's telling me, oh, Pat, well, you, you know, why are you losing so much weight? Well, you know, I only get to eat every other day. Dumb diddy dum dum never thought to walk her over and say, let's go get some more groceries and you, you load up. Get a bunch of staples while you're at it so you don't fall short. Why did that not occur to me? I don't know. I didn't mean any harm, but it didn't. We have to ask God to open our eyes and our hearts for every opportunity where we could be a blessing. I'm right there in the grocery store. It wouldn't have been a hardship for me to buy her a bunch of groceries. We as the body of Christ have to be more mindful of each other. And unfortunately, most of the time, we're not. We're too busy taking care of our four and no more. Or our two, I ain't got time for you. Whatever. But the bottom line is, what are we doing? Where is our mind? Sometimes, yes, we do get preoccupied with all the other deadlines we have to make. And we're trying to get from point A to point B to point A to point B to point A to point B and get everything covered before we get home. I get that. But sometimes that has to wait. It can wait a day. Because here's a more pressing need. We want to pay a bill two or three days early when we can wait till the day it's due and take care of her need right now. Take care of this poor man's need. His wife is dead. He's alone. He's a widower. We don't think of widows and widowers. We don't think of the senior citizens that are on limited incomes. We don't think about, you know, uh, like uh, uh, Marlene was saying, do you need, I have curtain rods right there on the floor in my hallway. Curtain rods. And everybody I ask how much it's going to cost to get it up, they charge me two more, more than I can afford. And these are church members. And I don't hold it against them. Those curtain rods have been sitting in this hallway for a year and a half. I have the curtains in the back room. All I need is somebody who knows how to install them correctly. Does it happen? No, because they're trying to make a living too, which I get. I get that. And I'm not fussing. My point is we all get so caught up in our own lives, our own needs, our own agendas, our own schedules, we forget about the people right in our midst, right under our noses, that are standing right in our face with their need wide open for the world to see. And we don't even think to say, oh, I'm not going to charge you. I'll just do it as an offering to the Lord. No, we don't think to do that. Now, I'm not totally faulting the body of Christ because I know this world system has set things so tight that it makes it very difficult for anybody to have time to do anything for anybody else because they're so busy hustling, trying to get up enough money to pay their own bills. Trust me, been there for a big portion of my life. I understand that. I really do. But as Jesus said, do this, but don't let the other be undone. Ask God to show you every opportunity you enter into 
and you may not have a clue, but the Holy Spirit can quicken you and say, this is your time to be a blessing. <clears throat> anyway, I hope that that says something to, to us as being more aware of other people's needs, looking outside of ourselves, looking outside of our cubicles, looking outside of me, myself, and I. God bless you. I pray that God helps me do the same, to be more mindful of others. All of us need to be that. We should have, even with our church, I would love for someone to man uh, um, a funding group. I mean, a funding thing that would handle the finances if somebody needs something in our group. There's money there for that. But here's the thing. We have good people who give, but there are some that never give. And in order to have that, I would give more in our group rather than the church I go to if we had a fund set up. But I don't want to handle that. I want someone in the group to handle it who is trustworthy. Not that I'm not trustworthy, but I'm a, I'm, I'm a screwball. I'm, I'm, yeah, I want somebody who can handle money. <laughs> Let's do like that, okay? All my money handling is in my head. I don't even keep books. Thank God he has blessed me to keep up with all my bills. They're all on time. I'm always checking with the bank to make sure that my money is right and, and my bills are straight. And that's a blessing. But we need somebody who's more methodical about something. Like, I'm not professional with that. So, anyway, y'all pray about it, the members of our church. And you see if God would have you consider being responsible for a, um, a um, what would you call it, um, a benevolence fund, so to speak. And then if any of us fall into a crisis, not just me, but if any of us fall into a crisis, it's there. Because we're giving on a weekly basis. And I thank you, those of you, you know who you are who have given to me faithfully, personally. I thank you for that because you've made all the difference. But all of us in our group have needs from time to time. And we want to be there for you when your time comes. But the money has to be there. And it can only be there if we're giving regularly. And I'm not saying tithe. I'm saying New Testament, free will giving. God bless you.